Hello and welcome to Zara Chronicles podcast, charging into another Champions League week like an Italian football manager at full time of a game when they've got something to say to the opposing striker. It's Nikki Vandini here. I have Patrick Hendrick and Mina Riziki with me in the booth today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give you all a reminder of our free seven day Chronicles Tifosi Patreon membership trials. Uh, you can get access to all of our full episodes, 100% ad free plus bonuses such as videos and behind the scenes content. Uh, just this week, um, for those of you looking forward to the Champions League games, we've got Mina Rizuki interviewing Phil Kitchmanidis, chatting about the Spanish perspective going into these massive last 16 clash uh, Champions League ties. So do give that a try if you haven't already. Um, Mina, Patrick, it has been quite a weekend um, of, of eventful Italian football drama I suppose it's hard to think about anything other than Roberto De Versa first sacked by Lecce for a headbutt on Thomas Henry at the end of Lecce's game this weekend uh, Mina I know you wanted to have a conversation about uh, which Italian football managers you thought would be best equipped to handle life behind bars because you think that's where De Versa clearly is headed for his post game incident. We're, we're being silly. So, <laughs> don't believe anything she says. Add we some don't context, think... Mina, quick. <laughs> we certainly don't think he's going to be in prison. <laughs> he's not. He's definitely not. But it started because I had d- done a show with, well, we did the the preview of the fo- Champions League matches between the Italian clubs and the Spaniards um, with Phil leaders and we started talking about Carlo Ancelotti and the whole tax issue that's going on in Spain. By the way, everyone seems to have a tax issue in Spain. I, I feel like I don't know what happens over there. No one pays taxes. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what it is. Yes, but either way, somehow Patrick had come out with the idea of how Ancelotti. Somehow, I don't think I'm the only one. <laughs> we'll put it to the listeners. It sounded very so... ambiguous to me. <laughs> okay, well, it is. okay. Simon, so could you listeners... insert the clip here now so we can? <laughs> Clip inserted. Um, I'm not a tax expert, but uh, no. I think we'll probably we'll probably see him avoid jail. I don't think he's going to jail. Oh, his eyebrows. Although <laughs> I feel like he'd have a terrific time over there. They'd all be such fans of his. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so this is apparently like, listen to this. And Patrick, what is it that you thought? I think you said Carlo Ancelotti with his eyebrows would be very popular in prison, but you said it in quite a sort of mischievous, coquettish tone, which made me think of perhaps some sort of, yeah, um, I, I need to steer clear of what I'm exactly <laughs> alluding to. But it, put it this way, it was ambiguous as to how, in, in what way Carlo Ancelotti would be popular with an all-male prison I, population. I think I think that's probably territory to, to steer ourselves away from. I, you know, I was just going to think. You know, I, I I I sort of could see some of them masterminding the system. You know, in the same way as as uh, Simone and Zaghi can can manage a football team. Could he navigate the prison politics and and make sure that he was in charge of of the dynamics in the in the the lunch hall? I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe I'm overthinking this one. Davide Nicola would crawl easy. through a mile of. Who wouldn't he He'd come out clean <laughs> on the other side? I think, yeah. Yes, apologies. Absolutely, mm. David Nicola would be the one with the uh, endurance to break out. I think that's. Uh, Do you think Jose Mourinho yeah. would blame the stewards <laughs> for like? <laughs> Well, Jose Mourinho, of course, broke into um, a Champions League game. I think it was at Chelsea when he'd been officially banned from the the sideline, and he snuck in via the uh, via the laundry bin. So Jose probably would know a way out of prison. But... Laundry, we hope. <laughs> we hope. Oh, Jose doesn't coach in Serie A anymore. Um, just quickly on this, actually, because Patrick, you were doing a bit of last minute uh, research. We were talking about mm. managers who have done things like Diversa before. Uh, to say Diversa has been fired by Lecce, which is not a small gesture, by the way, because they are in a relegation fight and currently are outside the relegation places. But um, we were talking about times as it happened before. Um, and you went to Alan Pardew. Um, who got how many games ban when he did it in England? Seven game ban, I think I just read. Yeah, so and it was almost a, ten years ago to the day, which makes me wonder whether we'll be revisiting this in twenty thirty four in March. And when but, was Daniel um, Rossi? 
Do you remember Delio Rossi? Delio Rossi, who punched Adam Jajic. Yeah, that mm-hmm. was uh, was an unsavoury incident. That was that's more mm-hmm. relevant, I guess, because it was uh, Italian football. That was when that would have been Fiorentina, I guess, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, it should, is it bad that I enjoy these incidents? Yes, it's probably <laughs> bad. Yeah. Can I just, um, in terms of uh, Daversa, mm. I feel some sympathy with him in the sense that Lecce have got a run of three or four matches where they're up against their rivals and they didn't beat Frosinone last weekend. They, they drew. And then they lost at home to Verona. They haven't won away all season, so they tend to collect all of their points at home. And then they're losing to a Verona side who've been completely gutted and dismantled in January. He's up against Marco Baroni, who kept Lecce in Serie A last year. I'm just not, not pleading his case or by any means saying we should condone this violence. What I am saying is I think you have to be in a sort of very frazzled state of mind to lose your head to that extent. And I think mm-hmm. he realised that with that result, he was going to be sacked anyway. So mm-hmm. he's seen that match as a sort of microcosm as to whether he will continue because I was just looking at it now. Lecce, they went win, draw, win, draw, win for their first five games. They're unbeaten for their first five games of the season. They took 11 points from 15. Since then, they've won two matches. Uh, and that's why they're sort of hurtling down, down the table. And I think he knew he was out of a job and you just resort to desperate measures. And um, and as I said, it's it's completely abhorrent and we can't condone it and in fact we should condemn it as Lecce did with a very swift mm-hmm. statement but I, I do think that um, we've all done things I'm sure at one time or another in our professional careers that we've regretted of course yeah. not yes. necessarily we all necessarily resort to violence when we're in front of television cameras being beamed around the world but I have thought about I do it, feel a bit, a, bit, a bit of sympathy for him because um you just wonder when he's next going to be back in a job. And yeah. also he's not going to be entitled to any payoff because I think it's just a causa. So it's going to be gross misconduct, presumably, because you can't do that. And um, so I, whilst I think it's easy to condemn him and we should condemn him, I don't think it's as black and white as being like, he's an absolute disgrace. He should get a lifetime ban from football. I, I, I try and feel a little bit of sympathy with him, albeit um, it's just a moment of absolute madness. I, I, I do think I should probably... Uh... I don't know if apology is right, but I, I was very flippant with the way I came into this podcast. Um, we're in perhaps a silly mood and we're joking about things, but um, obviously assaulting someone in the workplace is, is not okay. Um, and um, without question, Lecce have acted decisively and responded to that in, in a way that's appropriate. I think you have to take a step back and, and say, yes, football is, is its own thing, but still in any other line of work, if you headbutted someone from a rival company mm. the sack is the right way for that to be dealt with and and that's appropriate and i don't think um anyone is is contesting that um and uh and i think the delio rossi comparison is interesting delio rossi of course was managing adam Gajic at fiorentina and um Gajic was giving him some some back chat I guess on the bench after being substituted and, and Rossi turned around and thumped him and, and same thing again Fiorentina um, fired him for that uh, he was banned for, for three months on that occasion so a, a heavier ban the ban for the best I believe is four games so it's not actually a long ban but if obviously he hasn't got um, a club to manage anymore so that's the more uh, significant um, the more significant part of that story I, I don't know if, if you um wanted to add any more context on this guys obviously it's a story that's had a lot of international um international coverage you talked about the context of the the pressure and the situation down there at the bottom it's an extraordinary relegation fight that we probably should um dedicate some some specific time to at some point in the coming weeks but right now it's it's uh four points from Udinese in 13th down to uh Sassuolo in 19th, only four points separating them. So it's a really, really tight fight going on. And Lecce are right in the thick of it. Um, I think we probably still don't know all the details of exactly what happened between uh, Davers and Henri, specifically that led him to, to, to have that reaction. No, I don't, I don't think we, we do know. But clearly something he's done has, has really riled up Davers. So even then you can... You shouldn't really be going up and remonstrating with opposition players. I mean, it's been unsavoury enough. And it's it's been a bit of a bad couple of weeks for Serie A when we consider Ivan Juric saying to Vincenzo Italiano, ti taglio la gola, I'll slit your throat as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Juric obviously got a two-match ma- two touchline ban. And he then came out and said, I'd like to thank Daniele Prade and Vincenzo Italiano 
um, because they sort of pleaded the case on my behalf and said they knew me and said that I didn't obviously mean that. I was just caught up in the emotions of everything. And Yurich said, oh, it's quite generous. They only gave me a too much fan. There's a little bit of contrition, but I mean, it, it's not ideal, to be honest, because um, well, especially when you consider his nickname was Il Pirata, the pirate as well, Yurich. So sort of throat slitting is a little bit too close to the bone, uh, mm-hmm. no pun intended. Um, so I, I, I think it's not been good. We, we don't want these instances. Obviously, the stakes are high. Um, less so for Juric, I would say. I mean, Torino sort of also runs in the race for Europe. But, you know, there's people's jobs are on the line. There's huge sums of money involved in being in, in Serie A. But I don't think that should ever necessarily... You, you can't get carte blanche to uh, to behave however you want. I did see one um, Rome-based journalist who was being a little bit um, cheeky by saying, oh, thank goodness Mourinho's been sacked. Ever since then, coaches have been behaving impeccably now that the bad apple has been removed from <laughs> yeah. the crop. And so that was a little bit cheeky, as if to say, Juric first, now Davies, and maybe, you know, there was a lot of focus on the fact that mm-hmm. Mourinho was always having members of his backroom staff being sent off, and he was constantly arguing the toss with opposition players and match officials. So I think it's it's becoming a worrying trend for sure in the Italian game as a whole. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I think it's always worth pointing out it's, it's Italian football. Talk about Heidberts, people are going to think about Zidane. People might think about Gennaro mm. Gattuso as well, going up to Joe Jordan in that infamous game in 2011 and giving him a buck. Um, neither of those acceptable, clearly, but um, you have to hold your coaches and your uh, managers to a higher standard than players on the pitch. That's part of being um, a, a, a leader in the group. Um, we've had a bit of technical issue with Mina. I'm not actually sure she's back with us yet. Um, well, we're still not sure if we've got Mina um, coming back, unfortunately. But for now, Patrick and I will press on um, joys of modern technology. Uh, big game this week, without question, was uh, Bologna against Inter. I think a lot of us had this circled on our calendars because Bologna have been in such good form. Obviously, six games in a row they had won. They hadn't lost a game at the Sadio Planato Dallara, their home stadium, since August. Um, if any team was going to be able to throw a uh, throw a twig in the spokes of of Inter's uh, bike right now, you thought it was going to be this Bologna team at home, playing the way they're playing in a week when Inter are getting ready to play Atletico Madrid in the Champions League. Inter made six changes to their starting eleven, and somehow it still was just fine. They they won. I mean. It wasn't a rout by any means, but to me, it felt fairly comfortable, Patrick. Very comfortable, especially in the second half when they just sort of challenged Bologna to break them down. I mean, Bologna, I think, would have had more possession over the 90 minutes anyway, but in the second half, it felt very marked. And in the first half, I thought Bologna went a little bit overboard in their style of play. It felt like it was almost... Maybe I'm doing a disservice to Tiago Motta, but it felt like they were almost going, playing Bologna to the extreme with this gratuitous building out from the back. When at times I felt like a player could actually turn and go up the pitch, then often they were playing these triangles down by the corner flag. And a couple of times, Inter pressed them well and nearly scored. Victor Christiansen in, in particular um, dawdled in possession. Turan won it back. Barella was one on one. And Sony for a Skorupski, very good save that it kept it nil nil at that stage. What I, what I would say was I do wonder whether, and this is what I say, this is what I mean when I'm saying I wonder if I'm doing a disservice to Thiago Motta. I do wonder whether that was a sort of audition for him to bigger clubs and as if to say, look at how innovative I am. Look at how original my football is. Look at how I'm taking the game to winter. I'm not overawed by this. I was, I felt Bologna could have shown a little more humility in saying, Yes, this is the way we played. This is the way we set up. This is the game plan we've been working on for 18 months, ever since Thiago Motta has been in, in the job. However, this Inter team is special. It's a once in a generational team. And therefore, we need to show them greater respect. So we're going to adapt our game plan slightly. They didn't do that. And I felt that at times they were sort of playing into Inter's hands. And they didn't really create too many chances at all. There was just the second half. Aslani gave the ball away. Zixo should have squared it went himself and and in the end that was that was a mistake so it was a very it was for not the first time we've said this this season it was a hugely comfortable inter win with a clean sheet and one nil almost flatters Bologna yeah it's odd because if you look at the stats for this game you can see oh Bologna had 20 shots to Inter's five but actually a nil nil Inter could have scored about three times remember Alexis Sanchez had a shot at the near post Nicola Barella went clean through that's all before the goal happens um 
And as you said, in the second half, they kind of said, all right, then, well, we've got our lead and show us you can break us down. And, and Bologna couldn't. Um, I, 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 in my article for The Guardian this week, came to this post-game interview that I thought was was um, fun. It was a, a callback um, by the post-game interviewer of Simone Inzaghi to a conversation he'd had with Marco Parolo, his former player at, at Lazio, where Parolo said, when we were at Lazio, you basically said as a challenge, you said you'd buy us dinner if we can score a goal set up by one wing back and scored by the other wing back. Um, and, uh, and this was in December and Parolo was saying, so what is it you're trying for with this Inter team? You're trying to get one of your three centre-backs to set up the other centre-back with the way that those centre-backs are joining the attack so freely. And this was the game when, when that happened. Bastoni with his cross from the left, Bissek with really like a proper striker's diving header I felt like from Bissek that wasn't like a oh I'm a defender who's who's got a bit of a nosebleed coming up here that was a a real like when you look at the still photos he's 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 looking good while he's doing it you know he looks like he's he's meant to be there scoring that goal um and and the thing is um as I wrote what's extraordinary about this um is that it is an extraordinary Mina like we're, we're used to seeing um we're used to seeing Inter score these goals. We're used to seeing Inter play these crosses. We're used to seeing Bastoni on the edge of the box putting those balls in. That's just how they play now. The, the defence is part of the attack and and players can swap positions really freely in this Inter team. Yeah, absolutely. And considering the fact that everyone just take, partakes in the action, everyone has an opportunity to score a goal, everyone is involved. We're talking about 70 goals in 28 games. That's that's averaging 2.5 goals a game. I mean, this is such a, an attack-minded team that really understands its power. I mean, it, it, I'm fascinated by the power of psychology. I remember a lot of the times, uh, Nikki, when we used to talk to Gab Marcotti on the show, he used to say, I don't ever believe in psychology. And yet you look at this team that performed and did so well last season, by the way. on, on When you look at their performances last season in matches, whether it's against Barcelona, in the Champions League, in the early stages... Inter have been fascinating to watch. The difference was that last year they were conceding a ton of goals, especially at the start mm-hmm. of the season. And unfortunately, started to really lag behind in, in the opportunity to challenge Napoli for the title. This season, we're seeing a team that really believes in itself. Um, the football is even stronger, but it's not that it's stronger. It's just more disciplined right now. And I think that's what's so fascinating to watch about it. It's that this is... This is how psychology matters. It's not like this team has now got like all these. I mean, Turam is an added value, obviously. Um, there are, you know, having him now up front is certainly making a difference for Lautaro Martinez as well as for himself. But it's just how the team respond to everything. It, it's it's kind of like we're going to win this regardless, even if we don't need to win this, even if we don't need to be on top form, we will. We. It's amazing to me. And I think this is why it's so important to discuss psychology in general. But I just wanted to ask something, Patrick, because you you said, I'll be honest with you guys, I was watching the Formula One race when this game was happening, largely because I wanted to see an 18-year-old in a Ferrari uh, car. But um, I wanted to say that when I read this, the, the team sheet, I noticed that Bologna had changed quite a lot of their midfielders. And I was when I was watching... The game, you said that they didn't show humility, but isn't that sort of like setting up for into being a destructive battleship? And let's go with a more cautious approach to try to make sure that we don't concede. Possibly, yeah. They they went with uh, Jens Odgaard, who'd had a year in the Inter Academy, and he he signed in January. He scored a couple of goals off the bench, and he was very hard work. He was one of the best players in the first half, actually tracking back from a right wing position. And but not someone who gives you anything going forward, right? Um, it's a little bit like having Damian rather than Dumfries. It's it's sort of I a cautious approach. I don't think it's as black and white as that. I think it's it's a nod to the fact that he's probably more tactically disciplined and a bit more mobile than Orsolini, who's more of a more of a match winner. I think the plan might have been to to try and keep the game at nil-nil and then have some of those players come off off the bench in the second half, including Orsolini and Fabian, who was the other one that they yeah, signed for. Yeah, that's another Inter. one. Um, Fabian, he yeah. didn't start. He didn't, but Thiago Motta tends, he's a little bit like um, Vincenzo Italiano in that, res- in that respect, the Fiorentina coach, in that he keeps you guessing with his team selection. You know, Ricardo Calafiori has been having rave reviews all season long and been talked about as an Italy international, but in recent weeks he's preferred John Lucumi as the left centre-back. So I don't know how much to read into that. I think it was, certainly was perhaps, yeah, as you said, it was a, a way of saying we're going to show into more respect, we're going to be a little bit more cautious defensively. Mm. But mm. I do feel that, again, some some of it was just 
gratuitous building out from the back and um it's it's not to my taste particularly but you know that's that's my own subjective you see, this is this I is where it's it... not Jamina's taste I mean this is pet bull right this is <laughs> Well, I think it's yeah, I think it's so interesting because like I remember that sometimes sort of let's say what's having with Ange Postacoglu or in general what people favor these days is is you know a team that always shows its identity right like we hate Madrid or we hate Juventus because they don't play a, a specific brand of football that you can differentiate from all the other teams. But one thing that Tiago Monta does is say, I'm always going to do this, whether you like it or not, even if it's risky, even if it's the approach might cause us problems, this is the way that we play and I'm going to con- you know, continue trying. And all that results in is, is Gazetta falling over themselves with compliments about how he sticks to his guns. And, you know, it's all, it's, you know, the usual stupidness that we read sometimes about like how identity matters more than results. But isn't, isn't that... <laughs> We talk about Roma Brighton. (laughs) Oh, hang on. (laughs) But isn't this the whole thing, right? Isn't this like him sticking to his guns to teach these young players that they shouldn't continue to insist on a specific game plan, even if they make mistakes? Because surely if you continue repeating something over and over again, then you will start succeeding. I mean, I, I, I kind of want to spin that around just because I think they're playing against a team that has one of the clearest identities of, of any of the top teams in Europe right now. I think Inter absolutely are succeeding because of the identity of their football. And I think it's a brand of football that's something genuinely different to what I see anyone else in Europe playing. What what Mott is doing, I think, is... is um, I, I understand where you're coming from, because I do think that, like, that point that was made a lot. I always think back to that ridiculous game between Tottenham and Chelsea where people were saying, oh yes, but Andrew stuck to his guns and that's a good thing. Um, Whereas, um, whereas do we say that for Bologna? I mean, it was an odd situation really this game because on the one hand, I've started off saying it from the Inter perspective, this would look like one of the the tougher games left for them um, and they breeze through it. You could turn that on its head and say from Bologna's point of view, you're playing an Inter team that's won 12 games in a row. Nobody really expects you to beat them. So is it a free hit? The reason it isn't is because Bologna actually still have to fight for their top four spot, whereas Inter, realistically, if they'd lost this game, would have made no difference to them at all. I mean, here's the thing. Bologna have Empoli, Salernitana, Frosinone and Monza next. So this isn't a game that they have to win when you consider the four matches that they need to play next. I mean, Empoli is probably a lot tougher than it used to be. Salernitana, Frosinone, you'd imagine these would be easy wins in Monza. Well, you know what my feelings are about that team. Mm -hmm. So it's... it's, Roma away coming up in, in the middle of April. I'm looking forward to that one. That's going to be interesting. But I did, if anything, in this match, from what I looked, you know, and, and from the highlights that I saw, the one thing that did disappoint me about about this game in particularly is that I thought that they were too cautious. I would have liked the substitutes to have come on a little bit earlier. I would have liked them to have really gone for it, if that makes sense. But I also understand that this is a team that's chasing top four and they don't have the the pleasure in doing that. But it's your opportunity. This is what I mean. It is a free hit. Like in... Not in the sense that, you know, you are resting Lautaro Martinez, you are resting Di Marco, right? There is there is the opportunity to get at this Inter who weren't necessarily desperate to get the points in this particular match because they have such a, a huge lead over second place. But that's the one thing that, you know, I think it's funny because Thiago Mott is being linked to the Juventus job and everyone hates, you know, like the current cautious approach that Juventus play under Allegri and it's all like safety first. And, and I was like, well, this... I'm not sure that Thiago Motta is the one that's always playing courageous football, is my, this, my thing. This is, this is the crux of this question that I think we have to get to, Mina. Thiago Motta replacing Allegri in the summer, would you say yes to it or no? I mean, I, if it's up to me, I'd have Allegri for the rest of my life. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Max can do but, no wrong. Yeah, I mean, I'd like Max to go now because I can't deal with having to deal with the stupid fans, to be honest with you, who like, oh, there's no regret, there's no... Ugh, I can't deal yeah. with that anymore, so I want him to go just because I can't deal with it. Um, it's like, it's it's giving me mental health issues because of the stupid fans. Sorry, guys. Um, but um, Thiago Motta, I do think, is, is a phenomenal coach. I, I do like... For me, I love that he's pragmatic. But for the fans that want Deserbi in charge... Then yes, for me, I'm I'm never gonna I'm I will I would never want those types of coaches at my club. I would always lean towards Thiago Motta, who does play a style of football but can be pragmatic when needs to be. 
and does understand the total balance of football because of the kind of player that he was. So for me, yes, he's my ideal replacement. But I'll tell you something. I don't think Zidane is is not a possibility. So Oh, that's that's I do I know worry for you would love to see Zidane back. Mm, Speaking of headbutts again. <laughs> I think Thiago Motta would be a good fit for Juventus, but I, I worry yeah. if it's not three years too late. Not him, per se. I don't think he was ready three years ago. But what I mean by that is, this is going to be a fourth season in a row that Juventus haven't won the Scudetto. If you're suddenly mm. saying we need a whole rebuild and you're saying that we're going to turn to young players and we're using the next gen, Juntili's going to do this and that, we've still got to manage the finances, and they've just had a 200 million euro capital increase just to sort of balance the books so they've issued a whole load of shares, etc., if you're giving someone like Tiago Motta a job as a... Serial Chronicles is a Serial Chronicles production.